Hi, this is your host Swamin Bharatiya and welcome to another episode of TFR Insights. So today we have with us Craig Chadwell, VP of Product at Sovereign. Craig, you recently, not recently, but you know, you are new to Sovereign. So uh, first of all, tell me about what kind of company are we looking at Sovereign today? Because you also had a successful round of you know funding. So talk about the company itself. So Software at its core is a company that is built on the premise that hardware does make a difference when you're building products, uh, especially when you're trying to solve a very specific kind of problem. It's also built around this core premise that open source software is going to be a major driver of innovation now and moving forward. And so a big part of what Software does as a company is marry those two concepts, the concept that uh, hardware does make a difference in making systems more efficient, more cost effective, reducing total cost of ownership, and that there are open source projects out there that are going to derive a lot of value for a lot of different enterprises. The interesting thing is is merging those two concepts and then building an ecosystem of support frameworks and automation, ease of use capabilities and integrations with other aspects of the data center or, or customer's workflow around those two uh, those two basic components. We are also seeing uh, a lot of changes in the the IT landscape itself. Uh, we talk about hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, uh, more and more companies are looking at um, cloud-based storage. So how is the data center uh, itself is changing, especially also uh, in this uh, in the, 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 the crisis that we are going through. So, you know, I, I kind of categorize it in two separate areas. There's the, there's the short-term aspects of what's going on in the world right now. And then there's the long-term, more secular trends that might or might not have been accelerated by what we're, we're currently seeing in the market and in the world. And that, in that short-term category, we're seeing definitely more lights out operations in data centers. I, frankly, just because people aren't allowed to come into data centers as frequently or as in as great a number as they have been typically. And that's a trend that's been you know going on for a while from a security perspective in terms of minimizing who is allowed to come into a site. But now we're seeing it, uh, we're seeing new limitations around not just who comes in, but how many people you can have it at one time. And that, that really has an impact on things like manageability, your, your ability to recover from operational issues or maintenance issues. A couple of the longer term things that we're seeing, though, is uh, definitely an increase in data movement to the edge. And, you know, part of that, it's not driven by anything recent. It's driven by the fact that there are a lot more devices now on the edge than there have been in the past. And uh, those devices are gathering and analyzing a lot more data than they have been in the past. And the network infrastructure to back all that stuff all, all back to a centralized uh, data center it, it doesn't exist quite yet. A lot of that's going to change with 5G, but the other side of the coin there is with, with network infrastructure enhancements, you also get the opportunity to push rich analysis and data out closer to your customers. And since, um, since you know, what's going on in the world right now, we're seeing a lot of organizations reconsidering the idea, the notion of packing all their people into uh, one centralized building for the operational efficiency of that. Uh, we're seeing more distributed workforces, and those distributed workforces still expect the applications they use on a day-to-day -day basis to run as quickly or as well as they did back when they were at the major corp site. And so that means moving data, moving applications and interfaces closer to where, there's, where those users are. Uh, one of the others that we're seeing, which is not a direct result, but sort of an unintended consequence of um, a, a global, let's say, minor slowdown is uh, much broader adoption of open source technologies. I mean, some of that's been driven by, uh, again, secular issues in the IT industry, having to do more with less, uh, having to solve problems that are more focused to the core competency of a particular organization. Uh, but a lot of that's just driven by you know, the fact that w we have companies who aren't pulling in necessarily as much revenue on a short-term basis right now. And so rather than keeping projects on hold, they're trying to figure out ways to complete those projects 
or at least bootstrap those projects without making massive infrastructure or application level investments. One more thing is that uh, as much as uh, companies are moving to cloud, uh, there are a lot of um, use cases for a lot of reasons. Uh, data centers are uh, as important today or in the future as they were in the past. Edge is also creating a unique use cases where uh, everything is where the user is. You don't have to send everything all the way to the cloud. Uh, I mean, governments are a very good example, and a lot of businesses, you know, they are dealing with critical. Uh, they they have to have their own uh, infrastructure. They have data centers. So that is why we don't talk about just cloud. We talk about hybrid cloud. You know, mix the match of both. So can you also uh, kind of talk about that uh, the the importance or significance or relevance of uh, data center, even in this post-crisis world? Yes, I don't think data centers are going anywhere. And if you if you talk to people in the industry, what they're telling you is that it's, it's probably going to be the opposite. But instead of having these massive data centers, what you'll have is micro pops, points of presence, that correspond to the, uh, the interconnects where uh, your, your data uplink happens to be. And so you're, we're seeing in the industry, just as an example, a lot of uh, large traditional real estate investment companies buying up property that are very close to, let's say, cell towers, for example, because now you'll be able to drop a pop that has a, a micro data center capacity into that cell tower, and now you'll be able to extend the reach of a cloud infrastructure out to that edge uh, edge data center so that you can uh, allow applications to be built that have that local point of presence all the way down to the the region or zip code or even smaller level. And that, that becomes really important uh, for you know, safety and security applications. We're, we're, we're hearing uh, more and more governments, uh, small businesses in, in particular, talking about deploying massive amounts of uh, cameras, not not for surveillance, but for uh, things like object detection or uh, bottleneck detection in traffic systems so that they can adjust signaling and help people get to work faster. Uh, but we're also seeing it in the entertainment world. Uh, wouldn't you like your Pokemon Go app to run a little faster? I, I would. Yeah, at the same time, you know, media companies, you know, they have to cache a lot of data locally. So they, like, whether you talk about Netflix or whoever it is, they do need uh, a data center closer to me where they keep the cache of of my data, though they work with different, you know, but but you are absolutely right, especially with the explosion of Edge, 5G, things will change. Uh, and also one more thing is that, uh, that as we have seen some uh, kind of, uh, 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 services disruption in the cloud. When, when, once one cloud goes down, the whole world comes to a standstill. I don't think businesses will want to do that. You really don't want your Teslas to start driving because the cloud is down. And that's a bad example, but uh, I, I fully agree with you on that one. Now, there are changes which are happening in that society. There is no denying that. But what, do, what kind of challenges these changes pose not only for the customer, but also for uh, players like Soft Iron. Yeah, yeah. So you know the the fact that data centers have fewer people allowed into them at one time means that you can't necessarily get to a system as soon as it fails to replace a, a failed drive or to make configuration changes. And that means that the systems that are going into data centers they need to be more resilient to failure. They need to be able to self heal. They need to be able to. Uh, self-manage for some period of time so that it can basically account for that that gap in period of, of service for, of hands-on touch and that's a space where uh, soft iron because of our unique approach to building appliances and because of our strategic decision to align with Ceph which is designed from the ground up to be highly resilient and self-recovering uh, that's, that's where we have a particularly distinctive advantage in the in the case of data, you know, moving to the edge, I think that there are uh, there are a couple of interesting consequences of that. It means that the point of presence of that cache, like that, as you already mentioned, needs to sit closer to the people who are going to be consuming it, and those places may not be. Uh, built the way traditional data centers have. Anybody that's been into a data center knows that the power, the cooling, the space, the whole design has been built from the ground up for a certain level of efficiency and certain operating characteristics of that hardware. Well, if you're having to build out to an edge where 
uh, let's say it's a bank branch, just to throw out a random example, well, those buildings haven't been designed for that kind of spec. And so it requires a different kind of approach to building appliances that are comfortable running in that kind of environment. Again, it, it's a place where soft iron happens to shine because we build appliances that are task specific, which allows us to build the power and heat and space profiles in a way that's optimized for that particular task. And those optimizations happen to align really well to putting them in spaces where uh, traditional data centers aren't uh, necessarily spec'd. And then on the uh, and then on the, the open source technology adoption, you know that open source adoption is a it's a thing that's not going to go away. It's driven by uh, trends in the way that developers are being educated coming out of school. It's being driven by uh, the the economic models that we talked about earlier. But there are some there's some downstream consequences to open source that I think people are still trying to grapple with. Open source technologies don't always act in the, the most user-friendly ways, and they don't always have the greatest ecosystem integrations with other components. And so that, again, it's a, it's a space where there's a lot of opportunity for a company like SoftIron to embrace the open source culture and also help um, help build out, fill out some of the enterprise ready or enterprise expected feature set capabilities that make the product uh, whole from a, a complete product lifecycle user experience perspective. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And you actually uh, raise a lot of good points. Number one, of course, there is no way open source is going away because open source basically is. Uh, people may look at whatever they want to look at. It's a software development you know, model. It's a software, it's not a business model, it's a software development model where you collaborate with people. The basic idea is that instead of dedicating all your resources into R&D and writing code, you collaborate on that. So you save resources on that foundational code and put those resources towards adding value on top of that. That actually brings business, you know, that adds business value to it. At the same time, <clears throat> uh, it also kind of provides, I, I kind of sometimes compare it with farming, but it, it provides raw material. You know, sometimes you can also come up with, you know, a, a final product, but open source more or less like solves day one problem. Okay, you can download the code, you can install it. What about day two? What about maintenance? What about management? What about update? What about adding features that you need? So for all those, that's why commercialization of open source is really important for the sustainability of open source as well, because when you look at company like Software and who are you know commercializing on top of open source? You're also uh, not only allocating your own resources towards uh, supporting the very open source projects that you use, which could be Ceph or whatever. At the same time, you also build an ecosystem where there are a lot of other players who play a very critical role in the sustainability of that open source project. So sometimes people confuse open source involvement mid contribution code upstream as the biggest player. No, there are so many ways. It's a, it's a ecosystem. An ecosystem means everybody plays one or the other role. It's not all about that. So I fully agree with both the points uh, you, you made there. Uh, at the same time, I also want to talk to you a bit about um, that. Yes, uh, open source, you know, um, the, 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 there are some downfall as well. So talk about what role is software and playing, you know, in, in, in addressing some of those, these, uh, not addressing those, but adding value on top of open source, number one. You did allude to that earlier, so just touch upon that. But at the same time, what 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 is unique with open source is also that is the same open source project that five other companies are also using the same open source. So how is soft iron kind of differentiating itself from the other players who are also, you know, kind of offering, uh, you know, data center solutions? So it's a twofold question. Yeah, so most of the players out there that, that build commercially viable open source models are uh, software only companies. And so it ends up being a disconnected experience for customers who may want to buy and consume open source in the same single throat to choke appliance model that you might buy a uh, closed source proprietary vendors product. And that's that's what SoftIron at its core is doing. We're 
basically converging those two experiences to make the entire use of the product over its life cycle as seamless and simple to use as possible. Awesome. Uh, we are almost at the end of 2020. <laughs> These two months are going to be, look like two decades, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's a long year, but still. Uh, and uh, looking at how volatile the market is, Vita also creates a lot of opportunities. So what can we expect not only from software in 2021, but also how do you see market will change? You did talk about that in the very beginning, but how will the market evolve? How will software evolve with that? Talk about that. Yeah, so I expect you'll see a couple of things out of soft iron. Like, like, I've, um, like, like our CEO has mentioned you know, in the past, we're moving down this path of applying our task-specific design and our concepts of secure provenance and meeting customers where they are uh, in other areas. And so what you may see is that uh, we're building, today we build everything from the ground up in uh, California and the United States. I, I don't see us ever stopping building our products from the ground up and embracing and wrapping around the, the open source software level. But what you may see is uh, extension of that model that uh, micro manufacturing model out to other uh, regions so that we can be closer to our customers, we can meet them where they are, and so that we can be resilient to things like supply chain disruptions that may happen as as you know the market evolves. I, I don't have to tell you that over the last nine months, we've seen supply chain disruptions as a result of world events. Um, and so building a more resilient ecosystem of um, of of manufacturing and product delivery is an interesting space for us right now. The other one is around our uh, secure provenance and basic, basically being able to uh, make a very strong statement about um, basically being a clear box for our customers. If, if they needed to understand every component down to the silicon that's in our, our gear, we can share that with them. And, then, and it goes all the way up through the code level. We can share every bit of code that goes into our product, which is not something that a lot of people say. We apply that today to the storage world and uh, we're working on applying it to the networking and uh, multimedia worlds. You may see some additional areas spring up where we can apply our task-specific design to particular customer benefit. I think you're you're also going to see some broadening of our offerings within those spaces, where we've found some uh, additional unique opportunities to build a box that's fine-tuned to solve a particular problem. Uh, Craig, uh, thank you so much for taking time out from your schedule today and talk about uh, how the market, uh, the data center landscape is changing and how software is uh, helping customers maintain their hybrid cloud strategy. And I look forward to talk to you again. Thank you. Great. Thanks. It was great to be here.